Well, good morning. If you grab your copy of the scriptures, we're going to be in John 6 this morning. The Gospel of John 6. We're going to start at 65. These are the words from the Gospel of John at 65, 665. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. These are the words of the Lord. May they be heard as such. Before we get into our passage here this morning, let's take a look at what happened before all this. Peter here utters some of the most famous words in all of Scripture. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And at the heart of these words, we have the gospel. The disciples... Now, a quick mention of that word. That word gets interchanged with the word apostles in the New Testament. And that word, apostles, specifically has to do with a specific group of people. There are only certain apostles. That would be the 12, minus Judas, plus Matthias. And Paul and Barnabas are mentioned as apostles. But the word disciples has a larger meaning, um, and it literally means a follower or a student of a leader. Um, or a philosopher. So we have here a large group of disciples, people that were following Jesus, and he's laying out the gospel for them. They may not fully understand it just yet, but they're getting there, and they're getting it under the direction of God the Son, Jesus. Just before Peter says this, a question was asked, right? The question was asked by Jesus do you also want to go away? Jesus is looking at the 12, saying, what about you? So let's go back a little bit, and let's look at the events leading up to this passage. Jesus had started his earthly ministry and was really making quite a bit of a name for himself. He was baptized, he had cleansed the temple, and he was performing miracles and had sort of started bothering, I have that word in quotes on my notes, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a little irritated with this guy based on what he was doing and what he was saying. But he had grown this group of followers. He'd started to explain to those listening, which by this time was probably quite a large group of people. And in our account here today, we know that at least started out with 5,000. He had started to explain to them the truths of the gospel, a foreshadowing, if you will, of what's to come. How in order to see the kingdom, one must be born again. So he's become very well known, and people are following him around to see these miracles, to hear him speak. What's this guy going to do next? What's he going to say? And they want what he has. At least they seem to want what he has. He feeds them, he clothes them, he heals them. But remember, these disciples or followers are steeped in Jewish tradition. That's all they knew. The Torah, the Levitical law is all they knew to this point, and he's really churning up the waters. And really, it's more than just the Levitical law. It's the Pharisaical Levitical law. I don't know if that's an official term, but it's the Levitical law that the Pharisees kind of stepped up and made into something that God never had intended it to be. So at this point, he comes to the Sea of Galilee, and these disciples, these again at least 5,000, were following him because they saw his signs. They kind of wanted what he had. And this is where we have the account of the feeding of the 5,000. They all show up. They're um, on a hillside next to the Sea of Galilee. They're hungry uh, as they'd been traveling and been out of their homes. Um, but there wasn't a McDonald's available for 5,000 cheeseburger meals, right? So Jesus creates a meal for them out of fish and bread, by the way. 
I bet you it was probably one of the best meals they'd ever had. It was the freshest it could possibly be created by the hands of God the Son right in front of them. And in verse 14, it says, Those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So it would appear that they believe. It appears to us they're following him around. They're trying to get what he has that they believe. After this event, Jesus perceives that they're about to force him to be the king. Now, that can be slightly funny wording because Jesus knew everything. That's going to be important as we move throughout our passage today. He's not ever been surprised and has never learned anything as God the Son. But the people were always looking for a leader. People are always looking for a leader. But the ancient Jews, they're always seeking somebody to follow, somebody to worship. They're just always putting their hope and their trust in the wrong thing. If whatever it was that God provided for them wasn't enough, they would carve themselves a new thing and worship that. Because humans are naturally worshipers. That's who we are created to be. And we will find something to worship. So Jesus heads to the mountains alone. He often did this. The crowds were big. At the end of the feeding of the 5,000, he withdraws and heads to the mountains alone. And the 12... Now, this is the 12 specific disciples that Jesus had chose, got into the boat, headed across the Sea of Galilee. They're heading towards Capernaum. It starts to get dark and windy. And the 12 were about three to four miles out at sea. And at this point, we have the account of Jesus walking across the water. He walks across the sea to meet them. When he gets there, they're afraid, kind of like usual. And he tells them not to be, also kind of like usual. And when he gets into the boat, they receive him into the boat. They were immediately where they had intended to go over on the banks of Capernaum. Now the people, the 5,000 that were kind of left behind, the disciples that were there that he had just fed, they noticed that Jesus was gone. Jesus is not here anymore. They had witnessed the disciples get into the boat and head across the sea so they go to find him. They, they go to Capernaum to, to find Jesus, and they did. They found him, and they questioned him, and they got there, and I can kind of picture it going like this. Like, where did you come from? Uh, we saw the disciples get into the boat. We see them go across the sea. All of a sudden, you're here. And again, Jesus takes this opportunity to teach, explaining that what they were really craving was not the food that he had just provided them to literally eat. What they were looking for was him. The bread from heaven, these are the words that he uses. So they ask him for a sign to prove himself, like they haven't gotten enough already. And they bring up the manna, because he refers to himself as the bread from heaven. They, at least from history past, understand what bread from heaven is. They relate that to the 40 years wandering around the desert and this manna that they had found. Um, and they start to question him. They say, he says that I am the bread of life. It's me who you really need. And so they say, they want it. I want what you have. At least they think they want what he has. They're still thinking somewhat temporally. So he continues to give the foundations of the gospel. He's literally telling them how to obtain eternal life that he is the giver of life, that he's the one who has come down from heaven to do the will of the Father, and that everyone who sees the Son and believes will have this everlasting life. But they're still a little confused. Now, I don't know that I wouldn't be. Um, these things, this conversation that's happening between these disciples, these followers, and God the Son, Jesus, this was a monumental, life-changing period and conversation of life. They've come from a very traditional Jewish upbringing expecting one thing. They're expecting a king. They're expecting somebody to come in and take over and lead them and give them all the things that they had been hoping for and wanting for and fix all their problems, and they got this guy. He was born a baby, of all things. 
um, and was poor. He had literally nothing except what he carried around with him. The things Jesus is saying seem to be challenging the traditions and the ideas that they had grown up knowing. Remember, they had grown up knowing Pharisaical rule, not only God's rule. They're confused because even though they have seen, they don't really believe. And they get stuck on the illustration. Has this ever happened? You, get, you don't exactly know what's going on and we latch on to the illustration. They're upset that he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And that doesn't make sense because their ancestry has told them, no, no, it was manna. We woke up, we gathered it. So Jesus goes through it again. He had patience, probably more than me. Explaining that he is the bread of life. Those that ate the manna in the desert are dead. But those that eat of him, the bread of life, will not die. Anyone who eats this living bread will live forever. And that the bread he will give is his flesh. Again, foreshadowing the cross and what's going to happen, what's about to take place. And that he will give this flesh, this bread, for the life of the world. These are really hard things for ancient Jews to understand. It's very difficult from where they've come from. What their society tells them is true. Remember, they're coming from Levitical law where they were not even legally permitted to touch dead things or blood according to ceremonial law. And here in verse 53, Jesus says this, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. This is the teaching of Jesus. He's teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. He's teaching these disciples, following all these miracles that he just showed them, and he laid the gospel right out for them, telling them that they need him. They need to follow him. He's laying the foundation of the gospel. He's explaining his sacrifice, and that in order to have life, real life, they need him. Not just a temporal band-aid, of sorts, not just something you put in your mouth, not something that's going to fill your belly forever, something that truly nourishes your soul. By the way, eating and drinking, mind you, is not a literal command here, quite obviously, for many, many reasons throughout Scripture. But one, because here at this time, Jesus is still there. He's the one doing the talking. So he's not commanding them to eat him. As well, at the Lord, when the Lord's Supper was instituted in the upper room with the twelve on the night that he was betrayed, he was there also, and he clearly was there, and he was also not commanding them to eat him then. Nowhere in Scripture does it even remotely describe or command that humans are to actually eat the flesh and drink the blood of other humans. I feel like this is important to clarify because there are some religious traditions out there that do believe this is exactly what this passage is telling them to do. That would be called transubstantiation, and that would be hard to understand and confusing. It sounds almost comical to have to say that Jesus wasn't commanding them to actually eat him, but sadly it's not. Jesus is explaining reality, and he's explaining who he is at the foundation. He's not explaining that you need to have a meal tomorrow. He's explaining that I am your real meal. He's not starting a new tradition or a new rule. So much like the Jewish disciples in our account here in the book of John, those that believe this is a literal physical command are also very, very confused and very, very wrong. Now, Jesus knew that they were struggling with this information. Remember, this is Jesus. He knows. And then he knows that they're complaining amongst themselves. So he asks them if it offends them. Jesus always asks the perfect questions. I wish I had that ability. He asks them the perfect questions. And he asks if it offends them, and he explains that these words that he's speaking are life. This, I'm not just talking about food here. What I'm saying is life. But there are some who do not believe, and who, and who he knew would betray him. This is Judas. 
Jesus knows who they are, and he says in verse 65, and he said that, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by my Father. And that brings us to our passage today, to a point in Scripture here in the Gospel of John when Jesus asks a monumental question and receives a crucial response. There are three things that I want to take a look at or highlight about this passage. Three parts, if you will, that I think every Christian and non-Christian, for that matter, should be paying attention to. A question that we all need to respond to every hour of every day. So first we need to understand that not all will believe and be saved. Only those who have truly put their faith in Christ will remain. Those that have been drawn by the Father. How do we get to the Son? Through the Father. This is not the only time in Scripture where we've seen a group of people who claim to be in Christ. They claim to be Christians that were not included in the kingdom. In Matthew 7, and you don't have to turn there, but I think that in Matthew 7, 21, these are verses that if you read your Bible, every Christian thinks about every once in a while. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, this does not mean that some will be saved and then leave the faith. Some religious traditions teach that you can lose your salvation, lose your justification, and that is heresy. It's a false gospel because if you really believe that you can obtain justification before the Father and then lose it, you don't really understand how justification works in the first place. It's Christ that does the work. Solas Christus. Christ alone, not us. So at the very least, to claim that you can be saved and then unsaved, you'd also need to be comfortable believing that Christ's work on the cross was insufficient to truly complete the task. And if you're still on the fence here today, if you walk away hearing nothing else, hear this. Christ is sufficient. Jesus here is clear that he foreknew from when? From the beginning. Who did not believe and who would betray him. But he still took time to explain the truth. He knew he was Christ. He's God the Son, the second member of the Trinity. And he knows that most of the people in the group don't believe. But he still takes time to explain the truth. Because, for one thing, it's the truth. There's no need for Christ to hide from the truth. There's no need for me to hide from the truth. There's no need for us to hide from the truth. And two, there were some around that did believe. He also knew this. Even though he knew how the majority would react, he gave them the gospel. He didn't let their non-belief stand in the way of what the truth is. Saints, being a Christian is hard. If anybody stands before you and tells you different, they're selling you something, and it ain't the gospel. Scripture tells us that they'll hate us because they hated him first. And in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. He has overcome the world. Do we not see this very thing in our society right now? And we're not special. There's nothing new under the sun. But being a Christian outside of these doors is hard. Following Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, the real Jesus, not the lovey-dovey Jesus that's been created by society, is difficult. It's not going to be easy in a world that loves themselves more than they love anything else. There are people who are going to tell you you're wrong. There are people who are going to laugh and belittle you. There are even others who call themselves Christians, who go to churches with Christian-like names, who are going to say you're hateful and you need to be more loving just like Jesus. It's not going to be easy, but it is going to be joyful and peaceful Because in Christ, there is found true joy and a peace that passes understanding. 
And there's one who goes before us, and that's Christ. And if the King of Kings is for us, who really can be against us? The one who created the very molecules that we breathe that we can't see. He will not let you go. What Jesus was saying here was huge. He was, in a sense, turning their whole world upside down. Because they were raised their whole lives to believe that things were like this. And then he revealed the way that the religious leaders taught them and showed them and made them. And then he showed them what reality was. That it wasn't about what the Pharisees had told them about the sacrifices and the traditions and the rituals. So then to hear this somewhat 33, random 33-year-old guy who just kind of popped up, who's been doing some miracles, traveling around, he's from Nazareth of all places, right? Explain that he is what gets you eternal life. His flesh and his blood would be what you need. That would be hard. It would be confusing unless you had been drawn by the Father and the truth was revealed to you through him. Now, there's a little subpoint here in the shadows that I always like to encourage you with. We as Christians are commanded to go, to make disciples, and to teach them, and always be ready to have an answer for the hope that is in us. That's a command, not a request. If you are a Christian, you are doing those things. The question is whether you're doing them well or doing them poorly. And we do these things, go, making disciples, teaching them, one, by praying. We pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray. There is no such thing, really, as a non-praying Christian. And two, by sharing the gospel. Now, there will be times in your life when you feel like you kind of said everything right. You know, the Lord provided an opportunity for you. You laid the gospel out for them. The conversation went really well and they walked away and they didn't believe. And that might sit in your gut a little bit. Or maybe you feel really down on yourself because you missed an opportunity or didn't know an answer and you start to kind of blame yourself. Well, saints, it's important that we're diligent to study and to share and to be ready to fight for the lost and stand firm in the truth. But remember, the work is done by the Holy Spirit. It's his work, not our work. There has never been a person who could have been saved. If we just had, say, one more day, just one more opportunity, we could have saved them. That's not a real thing. The elect's names were written in the book of life before the beginning of time, and they will be saved. How, when, through what means, that's not our prerogative. That's not up to us. We don't know because we're not God. So we're to be obedient and to be ready and willing to be used. But remember here in our passage today, we see that there were very real human beings, very literal people who stood face to face with God the Son. Some of them even touched him and he gave them the gospel and they walked away non-believers. That's mind-blowing. So don't be too hard on yourself during the tough times for the people you've been praying for. Continue to pray for them because it's the Holy Spirit, it's not us. God blesses us by including us in his plan, but it's the Holy Spirit that does the work, and not all will believe. Next, we need to recognize who Jesus is speaking to. Throughout most of this, he's speaking to a large group, again, at least 5,000 people who are questioning him. Scripture tells us they're his disciples, so they're followers. They're literally following him around. But many of them didn't really believe. Verse 64 says, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were and who did not believe and who would betray him. They're interested They've seen and heard what he's doing, and they've literally left what they're doing to literally follow him around, not the literally like we use in 2022. That's what they were actually doing, was following him everywhere he went. They're asking questions and looking for answers, but they weren't sold. See, Jesus was teaching something that they didn't like. It wasn't what they were used to. It went against what societal norms are. 
And not only that, but their religious leaders really didn't like the guy. They were always trying to find a way to legally trip him up so they could stone him. So to be associated with somebody like that could be dangerous. It could cause you some trouble. Maybe you'd lose your job. Maybe you wouldn't be able to trade for food. Maybe you'd be kicked out of the temple or, or pushed out of town outside the walls with the lepers. And for them in that day, that was essentially a death sentence because if you couldn't trade and you couldn't live inside the city walls, you were all on your own. You had nothing. Maybe if you were really a solid follower of this Jesus guy, maybe it'd get you stoned. Right here, right now, this decision, do we follow Jesus? These words of his, I am the bread of life, have a cost. On this side of everlasting life, following Jesus comes at a cost. Grace is free. Make no mistake, the gift of salvation cannot be bought or earned. It's the work of Christ and Christ alone. But it comes at a cost. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in The Cost of Discipleship says this, Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow and it's grace because it calls us to follow Christ. It's costly because it cost a man his life. And it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. The disciples that had been following Jesus didn't count the cost. They had seen something that looked intriguing. This man was doing miracles. He was speaking out. He was making waves, saying things that kind of sounded good, something that we're interested in. But they were looking for temporary advantages. They wanted the food. They wanted the miracles. They wanted to be healed. They wanted a king. But they didn't count the cost. So they left. They went back. Verse 66 says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. The term here, went back, in the Greek means went back to what lay behind. The New American Standard Bible uses the word left. They left and walked away. The CSB and the ESV says turned back. They all mean went back to what they were doing before. They left him for something they thought was better. The text doesn't clarify what percentage went back, but it was many, most likely most. And immediately following their, leave, their leaving, Jesus turns from them and speaks immediately to the 12. Now he's looking at just the 12. So we moved from a large audience that's mixed with believers, non-believers, people that were all over the map, to a specific group of people, which almost all were believers, with the exception of, of course, Judas. It's the 12 that Jesus chose. This 12 has been intimately connected with Jesus. They were with him almost all the time during his ministry being taught by him, eating, sleeping, traveling. They were no doubt very, very close. These 12 men had been relatively ordinary men who were called by Jesus and used by God in an extraordinary way. They've heard everything Jesus had to say and has taught in both his full ministry and in this specific situation. He knows what they believe. He knows their hearts. He knows which one will betray him. And even though Jesus, the Son of God, knows what their heart condition is and knows what they believe, he asks them a question. And so we have the big question and the big answer. Jesus turns to the twelve and says, do you also want to go away? The New American Standard Bible says, you do not want to leave also, do you? They're faced with a question from the Messiah. What about you guys? Is it too hard for you too? Are you going too? Are you going to follow them and go back to what you like? I can kind of picture Jesus. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that. 
I can picture Jesus looking to this small group of who would be the leaders of the church that he chose, this small group of brothers put together by him for him and looking directly into their eyes and their hearts, really. He just laid out the gospel. He's just told everybody how to obtain eternal life, and it's hard. It's difficult to fully understand. It's confusing, even for those that believed. And it's going to be hard to live. It's going to be hard to be doers and not just hearers. So difficult, in fact, that many of the people around them couldn't do it. They left. They walked away. They wanted their old life, their old ways. So they left. They turned back. They turned back on the Messiah because they just couldn't believe. But Jesus sees them. He sees us how he intends us to be. And so he asks them straight up, do you also want to go away? He asks this small group of men who he knows intimately. He already knows their answer. He already knows what their heart condition is. But Jesus asks them, not so he knows what to do tomorrow, not so he knows what his plans are going to be for the future, whether they're going to go or not. He asks them because they need to respond. He wants to hear them say it. God knows it's not a mystery. We need to respond. And Peter responds, oh, Peter. Peter may be, may be my favorite biblical person, um, other than Christ, of course. Everybody asks, you know, if you could have lunch with one person, uh, living or dead, who would it be? It might be Peter, because he's so real. He was one of the first followers of Christ. He was a fisherman who had no amazing credentials to speak of. He was a little rash. He tended to shoot his mouth off a little. I know at least one person in this room has tended to shoot their mouth off a little bit in their life. He asks to walk on water and then sinks. He rebukes Jesus and then was quickly corrected. Peter, see, isn't he? He attacked the guard and cut his ear off. And it was Peter who, after boasting about denying Christ, denied him three times. But Peter loved Jesus. Peter would be instrumental in establishing the church. And Peter has one of my favorite interactions with Jesus in all of Scripture at the end of the book of John on a beach, which will have to be another lesson for another day. And Peter messed up plenty after this. He didn't live a perfect life after this statement that he made, but he remained in Christ. And Peter speaks up, and he gives the only answer that makes sense. The only answer that someone who truly believes could give Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we've come to believe that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Like, so what that it's going to be hard? How do you not make that decision? Peter's response to Jesus is a response we all need to understand. Saints, this life we're called to can be difficult. Satan wants to do everything he can to distract you and to annoy you. He wants to captivate and put doubt in your hearts with what's out there. The prince of the power of the air is masterfully using this world to accomplish his goals, which is just to get you to take your eyes off Christ just that much. The society we live in today hates Christ. They hate the Christian message. They don't want to submit, and they want you to be just like them. And they make it look attractive. They really do. I wouldn't stand up here and lie to you today. They're appealing to your desires, your eyes, your thoughts, your feelings, your flesh. They want you to think that their way is the right way and that their way is easier. And for 30 seconds, it might be. We live in a society that says you can be whatever you want to be, whenever you want to be it, and do basically whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it. The world out there is going to tell you that you don't have to be responsible. You can be a victim. They're going to tempt you with stuff, with money, with cars, with vacations, with entertainment. It's all right there for the taking. But our Lord is there asking you every day, what about you? Are you going to? Are you going to be like them and leave? Are you going to turn from the truth, from me, to follow them, to follow that stuff? 
Are you going to turn from me because it's a little hard and it's a little confusing? Or are you going to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me? The world is selling us a product. They have easy words that taste good and feel good. They promise to give you everything you want. But eternal life, true goodness, true joy, true love is found in Christ. And only in Christ. He has the words of eternal life. So choose this day whom you will serve. If you're a Christian, when your eyes open in the morning, which is harder for some of us than others, after giving thanks for that blessing, this question should swirl through your, plot, your thoughts and prayers. Do you also want to go away? And I pray, saints, that you answer, whether through laughter or through excitement or through confusion or through tears or through frustration and exhaustion, is, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I'm going to follow you. And I pray that you follow him with vigor. Give it everything you've got. Leave it all on the field. Because that's what he did for us. I'm going to end this morning with a quote from Charles Spurgeon. We believe the truth of the final perseverance of the saints concerning the true people of God. But the question comes to our heart, are we such? Is there in us the incorruptible seed that lives and abides forever? But how are we to know that we are such but by this perseverance? While it's an effect of grace, it's also one of the most certain tokens of it. For there is not the true grace of God in the heart where there is no perseverance in grace even unto the end. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Heavenly Father, you've given us your word to study, to meditate on. You've masterfully put it together for all times and all places, for all people, so that we can come to know you more, so we can hear from you. Father, as has been mentioned already, you are holy, holy, holy. Guide us, Lord. Protect us from what's going on out there and keep us focused on you. Give us the perseverance to stand firm in a world of chaos. We thank you for being a sovereign God who has never been surprised. Being steadfast, that's one of my favorite words for you, Lord. We can always count on you. Thank you so much for the gift of your son, for his perfect life and his death on the cross to provide for us eternal life. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Mm -hmm.